um, Janice has been called one of the world's leading thinkers on sustainable built environments. An artist and architect before becoming an urban designer and a city planner with the city of San, Fra with the city of San Francisco, Janice later became an attorney with a focus on environmental law and planning. She's lived and worked in Australia for many years and was a fellow at the Australian National University. Janice has held senior positions in urban design, land use planning, advocacy planning, architecture, and environmental education. She taught architecture in Tasmania, then at the University of Canberra, where she later started a suite of postgraduate courses in sustainable systems. Her qualifications include a PhD in environmental planning, management and governance, a Juris Doctor in law, MA in architecture, and a BA in fine arts. Where do you get time to do all this? Um, she's recently published a very positive book called Positive Development, uh, which is internationally uh, available and, and a well-received well book indeed. And she's currently Professor of Architecture at QUT. Talk now. You can talk now. Okay. Um, I'm the bearer of glad tidings. I actually think that the solutions are there. We just need a, a basic change in our mindset. I'm the victim of a happy childhood, so I can't really help it. I think the tragic uh, images that Paul showed can all be traced back to the design of our systems, including the built environment, not just agriculture and transportation. And once you realize that so-called environmental problems are caused by human design, then we know we can fix it, and we actually have the solutions. But what we've been doing is designing buildings and tools and metrics, measurement systems, based on industrial age thinking. So when we do design green buildings, uh, we're only mitigating the damage that we were going to do in the future. Um, we really need to uh, look at cities as a whole and the ongoing damage. I mean, it's great if we build a new city that really cuts down on energy and waste, but it's not sustainable. Green buildings are not sustainable, even though we've come a long way and there's great work there, and, and I applaud it. But all we're doing when we design, add a green building is that we're still in uh, half the energy uh, buildings account for 40% of energy consumption, half of that's embodied energy. Embodied energy would be a much greater proportion if we designed buildings that, that didn't use fossil fuel-based systems for heating, cooling, and ventilating, and other things. We could greatly, we could do much better, and some people have done much better than currently. So we have to realize that the existing cities are already 75% basically of our waste and our greenhouse emissions. And those, that's gonna continue even if we add new green buildings to the mess. So to be sustainable, cities have got to actually compensate for the damage we've already done, the loss of species, uh, the uh, extermination of peoples around the world, and cities are going to have to give back to nature and communities more than they take. That's a design problem. Our current buildings are not uh, approaching that kind of a, a standard because it's just based on doing things less bad. And our life cycle assessment tools only measure negative impacts. So we don't encourage people to say, well, how can this building actually increase ecosystem services? How can it give back to nature? Uh, not just designing buildings that work efficiently like an ecosystem or that mimic nature, but are actually ecologically positive. And we don't do that because we've said, well, energy and resources are what counts, and if we reduce those, 
will be somehow doing less damage to nature. Uh, that's not sustainable. So we can design for ecosystem services. So what I call positive development is where you're actually increasing the ecological base of regions by changing our cities, by ecologically retrofitting them, not just for energy, but with ecosystems and ecosystem services in mind. So buildings not only can clean the air, produce clean water, soil, food, and energy, but they actually support the uh, pre-settlement ecological base. I say pre-settlement because that's the only real benchmark we have. Uh, all our work is, has been on efficiency of inputs and outputs, not looking at total resource flows and how we can reduce those through ecological retrofitting. So positive development means increasing the life support system. It means design for ecosystem services. But it also means designing environments that increase the uh, public estate, so the means of survival. You're not going to have a democracy if people don't have water and food. We've been designing cities that are dependent on linear roads, wires, um, you know, ducts and um, pipes, and they get cut off in a tra in a environmental catastrophe that's basically been caused by sis our own systems design. So we need to make cities that are safe and secure, even in an emergency, and not have these atrocities like we've had in Haiti and so and in Pakistan. Now, retrofitting uses a lot less embodied energy and resources, but it can create much more fascinating uh, livable designs, and it pays for itself. There are case studies, been around for a long time, of minor retrofits of buildings just addressing things like <coughs> daylighting. The energy bill has paid for the work, but productivity has gone up significantly. Uh, so it's a great investment, and we have the technologies to go beyond just uh, creating the means of survival in urban areas. We can actually design cities that are eco-productive. There are plenty of precedents. I'm only mentioning a few. Living machines developed initially by John Todd are series of ecosystems that evolved to eat certain toxic sludge or sewage. And at the end of this chain of ecosystems that evolved naturally, uh, microbial activity that evolves to eat the toxins, you have clean fish and that's healthier than fish in our, in our so-called natural but polluted systems. That one picture was a a uh, sewage canal, raw sewage canal in a Chinese village. They put in this uh, living machine or restorer that because of its shape brought the water through it. The microbes um, were all excited to have this sewage. And the water that came out of it is now clean, but they've added social value. They've added economic value. It's now a tourist. Uh, potential and added life quality. Uh, so it's net positive in the sense that it's eco-productive and adding value. And there, there are lots of examples. Mushrooms have been used to clean up toxins. They transform the uh, toxins chemically so that there's no buildup of heavy metals and things like that. And that's that lower image, right? Yeah, that's the, um, the image there of uh, a lot of work's been done in British Columbia on uh, mushrooms and safe bio uh, insecticides made from mushrooms uh, are on the way. And the other image is of a self-contained interior system that 
secretes waste, produces vegetables, grows fish, and, bio, and produces biofuels. Um, I've got too many examples, really. When we take, most of our cities are not exciting central business district, um, you know, casinos. They're actually run down, semi-abandoned urban areas. They could be retrofitted in various ways, like wrapping an ecosystem around the building that increases the lifespan of that building, but has all these ecosystem services in the green scaffolding, like heat storage and circulation, uh, vertical wetlands that clean the water, food production. Uh, this is it's just an image, of course, but uh, it's something that could be done, and in fact, uh, we have uh, engineers who have uh, uh, certified this system. Uh, you can go on. So, you know, you could uh, conceivably, on a lower level, have, uh, well, living wallpaper, you know, displays of life forms that are greatly underappreciated. Um, uh, invertebrates are so important, the biomass in the soil, and we just don't even know about that. So it's a chance that buildings could be educational. And the building itself, when you have, there will always be new buildings, but they could be really integrated with uh, not just ecosystem services that produce things that people need, but actually provide habitats for things like small endangered species, uh, for people to, uh, like the local herpetology society could uh, take ownership of some of these spaces and so on. So we need to think beyond uh, you know, the building of the landscape and think about how we can design ecologically positive environments and their precedence even for retrofitting historic buildings that can integrate passive solar design and living systems so that we can have very diverse and exciting urban areas uh, uh, while keeping our cultural heritage not displacing people and making um, really very nice environments that pay for themselves through the energy, resource savings, and greater productivity and health. Is that it? Your last slide? Hmm. Well, thank you very much. So. I certainly hope you can see that there's an awful lot of possibilities uh, and, and it doesn't mean that we have to throw away what we've got. It really means building on it and with it and learning to weave in this new, more lively layer of, of, of human settlement.